E.T. the Extraterrestrial is back in theaters. Uh, its 40-year anniversary is being celebrated here in 2022, originally released in 1982, which was a banner year for genre films, 1982. So many, that literally was this sort of culmination of so many great genre movies coming out that year. Not all of them did well, though. Not all of them did well or endured, but that, look up 1982. Blade Runner, uh, Tron, E.T. the Extraterrestrial, so much good stuff in 1982. But I remember when E.T. came out, it's it was one of those films that uh, had a broad mainstream success, uh, and and this movie endures to today. Mm-hmm. A whole new generation of people watching E.T. the Extraterrestrial, and you just, um, having seen it in IMAX, really forgot the, how powerful that movie is. What's interesting about it, it came out at a time when like merchandising was a big deal. There was only one piece of merchandise that survived from E.T. They tried to merchandise it. There was an Atari 2600 game that tanked and the, that the legend of all the cartridges buried in the desert from Atari because they made more Atari 2600 cartridges of E.T., the terrest- extraterrestrial Atari 2600 video game than, than, than units existed that they could be played on. It was like this huge manufacturing error. So they are buried in the desert. There's a documentary about that, by the way. That you can see, look it up. Look up ET 20, Atari 2600. But the only thing was a plushie. That was it. And there was a terrible song that was on the radio. I hated this song. The Neil Diamond song, you did not like it. Turn on your heart light. <laughs> I hated that. Thankfully, the song is not in the movie. But that horrible song dominated radio play in the 80s, in 82. And it was inspired by the movie E.T. And it was a freaking awful song. But the movie holds up. Saw it last night in a with a packed crowd. I was very surprised. The 7 o'clock show, the AMC Burbank 16, p- packed house. Packed house. And just seeing it again, and, and, and just to be clear, this is the version with guns. Okay. This is the version that has the guns. Not the, they did a digital. I feel like Steven Spielberg was swayed to the dark side by George Lucas. Yeah, it was post. It was post the special editions. Post the Star Wars special editions. Like, yeah, why don't we do special editions of all these movies? I think a lot of this, the reason for doing it is contractual, and um, I hate to say this, greed, mm-hmm. greed, and then it's morbid curiosity. Uh, you know with like fans like myself that like, well, I want to see the special edition of E.T. How is it better? It's not better. It's awful. They well, we confirmed that the special editions existed to finance the prequels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, yeah, do you believe that? Like they made, George Lucas made the special editions to raise the money to make the Star Wars prequels on his own so he could, didn't have to be beholden to a bank. Mm-hmm. Yeah, crazy. So, so, but look, experiencing it with an audience that may have never seen it in theaters in its first run, it, you really see how powerful that film is, how good the child actors are in that film. They're just amazing. Drew Barrymore, how did she do all that stuff? And Dee Wallace oh, yeah. uh, is so good because I, I, I first saw Dee Wallace in The Hills Have Eyes. You ever seen that movie directed by Wes Craven? Uh, I've seen bits of it. I can't get through that movie. It's, I'm talking about the original. Yeah. <laughs> it's horrific. That movie scared the crap out of me as a kid. Set in the desert. This family is, you know, their they're, uh, little mobile home breaks down. They're kind of stuck in the mobile home. Dad gets shot. And then it's just this, this you know, fight for survival with these the people out in the, in, in the hills, just living in the hills. Uh, frightening movie. But Dee Wallace is in that film. And she's great in E.T. She really is amazing as the mother. Um, so uh, it was just fantastic to see it on the big screen. I'm glad it's back. And it's in the non-special edition format. I think that I think that the, the, the lessons, the, the special editions, they just, no one cares about the special editions of anything. Anything. I, don't, I can't think of any special edition that was improved. Maybe the the... The Blade Runner director's cut is the only thing I would say that improves the movie. 
Yeah. That's the only one off the top of my mind. And then like you're making a change for a political reason. That's the only reason they, they did that. And, you know, you can't you can't believe you're you're going to build a bigger audience when you do something like that. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, I know Alan. Alan has to leave in like 10 minutes. Um, and then James, James is Morosini. <laughs> Yeah, Morsini's coming on uh, from I Love My Dad. Cannot wait to chat with him about that film. But uh, before we do that, let's go to the chat comments here. Oh, my God, we have a lot lot of comments here. Let's go. Uh, Jinx says, extra aspect ratio. Bill T says, uh, is a member. E.T. terrified me as a child. Uh, Anonymous says, I have E.T. on 4K disc. Keep those discs. Keep those discs. Not the Batman. What? No, I sat way too close to the TV when watching ET back in the day. That was all. That was already my IMAX experience. Do you Mark remember the Gomez. buzz leading up to this movie? In in the sense of we didn't know what ET looked like. Yeah, they and, never. And the only way you could find out was to go and see the movie. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they never like. That's what was cool about about trailers back then. They didn't give a lot of stuff away. And the they movie just slowly reveals what he looks like. You know, you see his finger, and right, you know, and, right. You know, it was. It, oh, I hate the internet. <laughs> Mark Clement says, "1977-1984 is a golden age." And VDR, I'll take Carpenter's Thing over Spielberg's ET. I think they're both great. I think they're ones for kids. Ones for yeah. kids and the kids. Hey, <laughs> the thing, John Carpenter's The Thing came out in 1982. Mm -hmm. What a great year. What a great year. Yeah. Uh, VDR, does Chris appreciate the Yoda cameo in E.T.? Of course. It got a big laugh last night. <laughs> so if you can catch it in a theater, do it. Really old movie says Superman 2 Richard Donner cut. Yeah, I like that cut. I th The cut is better. What I don't like is the audio mix. They changed, They added all this extra sound that was completely unnecessary. And I don't do not like that. So the cut, yeah, but they the the remix on the sound did not yeah. improve it. I need to see that. I recently saw the original Superman two, and oh man, does that not hold up? <laughs> Scott Slaughterbeck says special edition of Close Encounters was a bit better. Yeah, yeah. They and in fact, there's talk of releasing that, and Jaws is coming back to theaters. It's weird that like, here's what's weird. I can't remember a time, like certainly there would be retrospective screenings of movies back in the day. Can you remember a time when more like mainstream movies are being re-released to theaters than I can't remember any other time? And yeah. this is, is, is this because Hollywood doesn't know how to do it anymore? Yep. That's exactly the reason. There, there's no E.T. original, Raiders of Lost Ark original, you know, it, it you know, for some reason now Hollywood has to go to intellectual properties because they don't trust people to be original anymore and they won't invest a hundred million dollars in a story that hasn't been proven in some way, whether it's a comic book, a novel or, or what have you. Um, and then, you know, and then it's weird just to see that the 40th anniversary of ET, um, it just constant reminders of how old I am and how much older I'm getting. Um, you know, I think I've talked about this before, but, you know, I found recently, uh, you know, my favorite, one of my favorite radio stations uh, became an 80s station until I realized, no, that's that's the oldest station I used to listen to as a kid. Um, and so, yeah, I'm getting old. All right, let's uh, take a look at a few more comments here. Uh, we got that one. Um, yeah, John Manilang. Uh Jaws is coming back to theaters next month, I think. Yeah, I haven't heard that yet. Um, Antoine Denison, E.T. also got a shout out at the Imperial Senate in the uh, Star Wars prequels. That's right. There's a box in the uh, Senate there uh, with, I think, three E.T.s in it. Uh, let's see. Patrick Lemire. Eminem is passed on sponsorship, paving the way for Reese's Pieces. Yes, if... I never did this before until E.T. came out, but I read the novel, uh, the novelization of E.T. And in that novel, uh, it is M&M's and not Reese's Pieces. Uh, but still, M&M is the better of the two. Uh, Dempsey, Hollywood needs more Mel Brooks. Yes. 
Yes, at least old Mel Brooks, you know, young Frankenstein Mel Brooks, Blazing Sal's Mel Brooks. Um, as much as I like Robin Hood and uh, Spaceballs, um, you know, those are just more parodies. I want the smart comedies of, of early Mel Brooks. All right, you're back. And I'm I got to go soon. Wait, and we, did we get to this comment? Auto Tomato? Nope. Don't agree. Preferred the Blade Runner theatrical cut. Yeah, I, there I, enough I, difference to really make a make a decision like that. Definitive no, decision. I mean, well, I think the main big the big difference is the voiceover, mm -hmm. right? It's sort of a detective voiceover, and of course the the lore is that Harrison Ford purposely did a terrible job on the the voiceover, hoping that they wouldn't use it because he thought it was a bad choice, and then they left it in. <laughs> yeah, so uh, let's see if we got to this comment. Sorry, I had to. No. Quick bathroom break, because Alan's got to leave. John Manalang, member, thank you for that. Yeah, Hollywood's well of creativity has been stagnant for quite some time now. I just feel like here's where Hollywood's at, is they don't know what to do after the end of Endgame. I mean, it's very clear that the phase four of Marvel is weak and directionless, and you can feel it. You can really feel it. And it's, I believe it's reflected in the box office. There is a, I don't know that there's superhero fatigue. There's definitely bad movie fatigue and there's Marvel fatigue. I think we kind of see where Marvel's going based on the Disney plus shows. I haven't liked any of the Marvel Disney plus shows. I haven't liked any of them. The only, the one I'm looking forward to oddly, please don't judge. is <laughs> She-Hulk. She-Hulk. Well, We'll we'll have word on that this week. <laughs> we'll talk about it. We'll talk yeah. about it. Um, maybe we should do a stream on Monday. Maybe. Yeah. We we have the. I don't, I don't know if we mentioned, but we do have the first four episodes. Okay. So we'll have to watch those. Yeah. Uh, great. All right. Well, uh, I recommend seeing this in a theater. I think it's amazing. I I you know and also. What's interesting about seeing re-released films in a theater is it, it stands in contrast to a lot of the Hollywood films made today where you're like, why can't Hollywood make a movie like that? Yeah. You know, well, that's what I'm saying is, you know, if they're going to invest a hundred, two hundred million dollars in a movie, they're not going to risk it on a, an original idea. So they're going to risk it on some kind of proven or not so proven intellectual property. Patrick Lemire says, I don't mind multiple cuts existing, but George Lucas bearing the original trilogy theatrical cuts is criminal. Well, that's why you need to get the despecialized editions. So <laughs> um, just look up Star Wars despecialized edition. Look it up. Look it up. You can find it. 